You're listening to the Staging Sips Podcast with Lori Fisher. This podcast is dedicated to helping real estate staging CEOs build healthy businesses that grow, flow, and thrive. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Actually, I'm here a second time recording this episode. For some reason, the audio didn't come through on the first time. So hopefully I'm really practiced at it and it will be a really good episode for you. So this week, we're talking about how to train your team through empowerment. And this is kicking off a series about how to have team and prepare for team if you don't have one. And even if you don't have team yet, and maybe it's not even on your radar, this might just be helpful for you to listen to just to hear the way I think about it so that if things change, you know, we can redesign in our businesses all the time. But really, next to you and your inventory, your team is really your most valuable asset. And maybe at times they could be more valuable than both of both you and your inventory when you get them up and running. Because um, when you have a solid team in place, it allows you to really begin to reduce your stress level, work with more people, work with more people efficiently and allow you to step back and stop being the technician like it's called inside of the EMF Revisited. And, you know, it really requires a, a variety of skill sets that um, we may or may not have had experience with in our pre- previous lives. Developing a team requires time, first of all. It takes time not only to bring on a new team member, but then fully train them and get them comfortable with you, your processes, your systems, your style, your aesthetic, all of it. It takes patience. This is the part that's probably the hardest for many of us. When you bring on someone new, it absolutely slows you down. You also will find out very quickly all of the ways you didn't think to be ready to have this person on board and things that you didn't explain very clearly and documentation that you didn't have. It's really, it takes a lot of patience and grace, not only for your new team member, but for yourself. There's a ton of personal growth that happens. Many of us are stopped by perfection paralysis. We worry about our clients only wanting to work with us. We worry that a team member might do something that could jeopardize a relationship or not have uh, our aesthetic dialed in quite so well or the way that they talk to clients, all of that. It takes a lot of letting go and allowing for things to happen that, you know, maybe you didn't anticipate. Maybe it's, you know, you need to allow for something that went wrong that you need to kind of work through and fix with your new team member. So it really takes a lot of letting go of that perfection and need to kind of be the one who's doing all of it. And up until this point, you've practiced doing everything really, really well. And so it's going to be hard to let things go because you know that you could jump in. I hear it all the time. I just want to jump in because I know I can get it done faster. But that's not the point. Eventually, that's true now. But if we're future thinking, what will happen is is that team member is going to handle it for you without you even knowing it and they will handle it extraordinarily quickly. And I have found in most cases way better than I have done it, like way better. When you hire the right person, they're going to be a thousand times better than you at their particular area of your company. Uh, Developing your team is going to require that you have systems documented, processes in place, frameworks, documentation, ongoing education, and what we're going to talk about today is empowerment. So this is really for that Accelerate business owner. We talk a lot about team in Rethink You Accelerate. We talk about the challenges of team, how to better work with our teams, strategies and things like that. So if you are a business owner who is at that phase where you're thinking about hiring, you're you're leveraging your own time a little bit too much and you're getting ready to hire, you're really the ideal candidate for that Rethink You Accelerate program. And that link is always in the show notes for you. Enrollment is open for you when you're ready. And that Accelerate takes you right through to the phase where you are starting to no longer really be the middle manager in your business, where you actually have team developed enough that they become the manager for your for your various uh, departments in your business. So Anyway, let me just dive in. So we'll we'll be talking about in future episodes, these next couple of episodes, 
We'll be talking about the mechanics of systems and processes, but today is really about empowerment. I also want to point you back to episodes 17, 18, and 19 that are also all about team, how to begin to hire the ideal uh, team member by using filters, as well as um, how to love up on your team and all that good stuff. So go back to those episodes if you haven't listened to them or just listen to them again. So let me talk about empowerment, what it is, why it matters, and how you can begin to empower your own team members in a variety of ways. So first of all, the, just the straight up definition of empowerment is authority or power given to someone to do something. Very simple, straightforward. But when I read things like authority and power given to someone, that really means to me that a high level of trust needs to be established. That's like that was the first thought I had when I I looked at the definition of this. And the other thought I had coming out of it was that this doesn't happen always right away, that empowerment is a process. And just like we talked about in our episode last week about planning for your 90 days, that fractions of actions empowerment happens through a variety of fractions of actions and a kind of uh, uh, fractions of letting go and fractions of training and seeing how it plays out and swooping in and and helping that team member troubleshoot if, if needed and things like that. So you can really see that empowerment is a process. But if you have a philosophy that you're going to empower your team, it can really help training them so much better. So let, I want to I want you to think about it like this. If I were to ask someone in my family right now to bring me a glass of water, um, they might show up with the wrong size glass. Maybe I wanted a tall glass and they've brought me a short glass. They might have brought me water that's warm when I wanted water that was cold. They might have brought it without ice when I wanted ice. So you can see just simply by asking someone, would you mind grabbing me a glass of water, please, could actually be so vague that they don't get it exactly the way you want it. So imagine now your staging team when they're tasked with working with clients at a consultation or an eval or they're installing a vacant and how much is really open to interpretation, even if you thought you've been clear about the way you like things to be done. So you can see that you're not necessarily going to know right away all of the ways that you need to share and communicate what you want to have done and how you want it to be done. And your team is likely going to do one of two things. They're either going to wait for super clear direction from you or they'll be always checking in, especially in the beginning, to make sure that they're doing something right because they really do want to do it the, the way that you want it to be done or they're not going to they're not going to do it the way you'd want to. They might take their own initiative and do something, make an executive decision. It may not be exactly what you'd want them to do, but they're at least trying to stretch their wings. So you've got a couple of scenarios there when you are um, about to go out into the world with your team that will happen. And it's really about how you think about it, um, each one of those scenarios that is really going to help you navigate bringing on this new team member and getting them up um uh, up to snuff a lot faster. And here's why it it matters to think about this ahead of time and to think about that you're going to come from a philosophy of empowerment because most likely this is going to be one of your first experiences as a brand new trainer or a brand new manager without some existing business scaffolding around it, right? So you may have had management experience in the past, but there's already an existing, maybe there's an existing business if you're not a serial entrepreneur and serial business owner. Um, so you may have already had certain processes in place that maybe you're tweaking and refining, but you're not building it from the ground up. And then as far as training, you know, if you've never built a training program before, again, this this is likely to be a big undertaking for you. So just, you know, give yourself some grace that an empowerment yourself that you're going to be learning just as well as your new hire will be learning as you go. When empowerment is part of your leadership model, though, it's got powerful results. This is why it really matters. According to a study recently reviewed in Harvard Business Review, leaders who were perceived as more empowering were more likely to 
delegate authority to their employees, which the employees appreciated having that trust, you're going to ask for their input and encourage autonomous decision making. And those those employees marked themselves having happier, more fulfilling work environments than those bo- those teams that didn't have an empowerment at the core of its leadership. And the cool thing is it works with our human brains, natural desire to feel trust and to be trusted. There's neuroscience behind empowerment. And you know me, I'm a geek. I want to share with you all of the ways that our brain functions so that it helps us in our results triad with the beliefs and actions, like our thoughts and our beliefs and how they drive our actions. But empowerment and trust are closely related. So I just want to have a caveat here when we're talking about the neuroscience of empowerment. Many of us were raised not to even trust ourselves, never mind trust others. This doesn't serve us in our businesses because as we go about developing support for our team, it does not serve us to not trust our teams and the people around us. So this is a learned experience. So when I'm sharing with you the neuroscience of empowerment, I am I am sharing what has been studied in a laboratory that has been reproduced that it means that our we our brains are wired for trust and for being empowered even if you don't believe it. That's you've likely been taught not to trust. That's a learned thing versus an actual like physiological, biological thing. So let me dive back into it. Okay. So lack of trust in our community is counter to how our brains actually function. Our brains are wired to trust one another. Working together has always been the key to survival of our species. And a new study has shown that our brains actually need and want to feel safe taking risks and expressing opinions. When we are trusted, oxytocin, a really feel-good hormone, is released in our bodies. And if you've listened to me at all before, you will know that feeling good and positive produces better and higher thinking and better and higher results. So by being an empowering leader and delegating and asking for input and encouraging decision-making, all of that leads to feel-good hormones being released in our team members so that they actually think more effectively. They perform more effectively. It's really kind of cool. So how does all of this work into your role as developing your team? Well, there are several ways that you can use empowerment and de- developing your team. So let me tell you what they are, and then we'll dive into each one of them. So the first is building a culture of trust. The second is that you should expect mistakes and communicate that you know there's going to be a learning curve. The third one is delegating problems, not tasks. The fourth is getting curious. The fifth is showing empathy. And the sixth is showing uh, supporting growth opportunities. So let's dive into each of these individually so that you can understand how you can incorporate these things. So the first thing is building a culture of trust. Building that idea that we are in this together, that we are sharing, you know, sometimes some crazy experiences, some weird experiences, but we're in this together. We are a team and that together we are creating tremendous results in moving our clients' lives forward, literally and figuratively. And if you are working with maybe it's investors or Airbnb owners, that idea that you are helping someone fulfill their dream and fulfill their business and you're helping people make a lot of money and all of that, like we want to be able to share in that together. We want to be able to share when we're building a culture of trust. One of the things that we shared within our business in the we're in it together mindset is that when we're on a job site, when we're on an install, we are likely going to tweak each other's work. And that goes all the way up to me. When I'm on a job, people should feel free to tweak what I have done and change it and make it better. We're in this together. Some of us have better strengths er and some of us have areas of opportunity. We can all learn from each other, but it's nothing personal that it is just about creating the very best result with what we are doing with one another. So we do it a lot with like in the beginning when a, a new team member's on, we tell them we're going to tweak your work and you're you're going to be able to tweak ours. Like when we're on a site, if you see something that I have placed, do you think it could be better? Go ahead, change it. Don't worry about it. We're going to do it and move on. 
we're not so attached to necessarily being absolutely right or absolutely perfect. We want to make sure that the team gets that we're building a trust. It's not personal. Um, and we, I want to always share with my team members too that I'm still learning that you're going to teach me something that I don't know. They're like my lead stager is a way better stager than I am. I'm always learning beautiful new ways to create accessorizing moments and coffee table arrangements and everything from Lisa because she's just so talented at it. And so she's forever tweaking my, my work and always for the better result. It's really, really awesome to see. So building that culture of trust is really, really important. Okay, number two, expect mistakes, but most importantly, communicate that you know that there's going to be a learning curve in everything you do. You're going to let your team member know that you are you know that you have missed some steps, most likely in the training process, that you can't possibly train someone on every scenario and every detail before they start going out and doing their assigned tasks, but you'll be learning together. Again, that kind of we're in it, I trust you. We're we're learning together. Listen, if something goes wrong, don't worry about it. We'll handle it. It's not that big of a deal at the end of the day. And especially for us, I mean, we work with a lot of repeat clients. They absolutely love us. They absolutely love our team. And occasionally over the years, have they they requested a tweak or something? Yes, it's totally happened. Has that meant that they have gone off to find another stager? Absolutely not. So it's I at this point in my business, I know that if we lose a client over one small mistake, which we did very early in the beginning, uh, this is really interesting, that brand new, I had hired uh, Lisa, my lead stager and my admin in April. And that summer I went on vacation. So it was July and we had a client where she requested a staging appointment and she wanted it in a certain timeline. And I was away and Lisa was not available and she has never worked with us since. And I was actually so happy that that happened because I always found her a difficult, demanding client. And I felt like fantastic. If she's not willing to wait four days, I think it was, for the next available appointment, then she's not a client that we want to have. So, But I had told Lisa when I was going away, do not feel like if a client is asking for an appointment that you've got to rearrange your life to make it happen. Let them know when your next availability is. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, that's fine too. I let I gave her that permission. So she felt empowered to let this client know when the first available appointment was without just causing a great upheaval to her life. So you want to also let them know correct, any correction and guidance isn't a reflection of them. Just like I said, it's a reflection of you learning how to best communicate what you want because really that is what's going on. So you're not going to necessarily know everything you have to say, just like I've said before, so let them know that ahead of time, that it's really a reflection about you and just making sure that you um, we are just taking an opportunity to share even deeper what you like, don't like, what you expect, et cetera. OK, so that's expecting mistakes and communicating that ahead of time. The third one, delegate problems, not tasks. When you delegate tasks, our team members don't believe we have faith in them doing more than just checking off the to do list. And really what we want is when we have team in place, we want them looking for problems that they can solve for us. They can help us solve. We want to encourage that problem solving mindset. And when we delegate a problem, our team gains a fuller engagement about how to solve for the problem. So if you're sharing a problem of, um, I don't know, the way that inventory gets uh, restocked or something like that, we share the whole reason say you know one of the things that we keep encountering is like for us lampshades always mismatch we're always encountering issue with lampshades mismatch not having we think we've got two of the same on site we don't have two of the same on the site let's think about how like can we think of a process by which we could actually you know fix this solve this so we went through this problem solving thing where we started you know, researching and looking and finding. And it ended up just being a super simple, we ended up getting out the label maker and we spent a good part of a day <laughs> matching up lampshades to each other, then lamp matching them up to their respective lampshades and then labeling them with the label maker so that you knew which set went with which. But it took a little time for us to kind of think about how could we get this done. And I think we even tried a couple of methods 
but I tasked the team with figuring out how to solve for it. I didn't, I didn't do that. I thought the team is the closest to this issue. They know that it's been not great being on site. And then you turn on two bedside lights and the shades are casting a different light because they're not the matching shades. So that's an example of when we want to delegate a problem, not a task. Um, so, oh, and here's another great example of a problem sol- a problem solving thing. We always were having in the beginning with new team members who were getting used to our consultation, our eval process, um, clients being resistant to recommendations during those dialing evals. So we talked about how could we solve for this? So the team created a how to prepare for your styling evaluation appointment that we send to each of our clients now where it talks about how we're a team and how a camera photographs your space and how we might take something out of the closet that you've tucked away for 20 years and we're going to use it in a new way. We may even shift your furniture around, but it's all because we know how a camera captures a space, all of that good stuff. We talked about, so that was the first thing. Then we talked about what would happen um, like how do we introduce the uh, what we're going to do at the beginning of the appointment? How do we talk to the client? How do we explain to them what's going to happen so that right from the very beginning, the, we are telling the client that we're going to make some recommendations, that it's up to you to decide what you want to implement and what you don't. These are the best recommendations that we have based on a decade's worth of experience doing staging work and having really successful sales, but it's up to you what you decide to do. Like all of that stuff is really important to share with the client. We also brainstormed at one of our Fab Friday meetings how we've overcome objections and what's the languaging that we use when we're overcoming objections. And that really helped us all hear how we have each handled something to reduce resistance for our clients. One of the ones that came up was that I'm simply going to tell you everything that I see that I think should be done based on my experience. Um, Because really, at the end of the day, what I don't want to have happen is you have showings and people give you feedback and I didn't say anything to you and you're going to wonder why I didn't. So I'm just going to share everything with you. Like that was really good verbiage for our team to pull together out of that session because it really does help the client understand, oh, okay, yeah, they do have to say everything, but I don't have to necessarily do it, right? Um, and we shared and we shared, meaning me and my lead stager who was training our newest team members, that we understand that clients aren't going to do everything 100 percent every time so that they should not feel responsible if the listing photos go live and they're not absolutely perfect. You know, all we can do is give the recommendations. It really is up to the client at the end of the day to make the decision how they want to completely go through our list and how they want to present their listing. So that really helped our team from an empowerment perspective, really begin to overcome objections and showed that I'm here to listen, I'm here to support, and we're here to help each other navigate a problem versus just tasks. Okay. The next one is to um, get curious. So get curious. So ask your team why they approach something the way they did. So if you're um, doing vacant installations, which is, I think, mostly where this would come up, you know, ask your team why they approach something the way they did and what was their thought process. You might be surprised at what they they come back with. And it might be an opportunity for you to work with them, you know, even more on helping them dial in their um, ability, you know, their styling abilities or whatever. So you want to go first to that. You want to seek to understand before you start just assuming that you know why they made a decision that they made. Um, Again, super, super empowering just to get curious and just to ask them why. Next up is showing empathy. Don't forget what it was like for you when you just started your staging business. I think a lot of us look back at our first styling photos and online listing photos and we're like, what were we thinking? (laughs) You know, so allow for the learning curve with your team. It's part of the process. You may have to go in and and teach and educate and tweak things a little bit for them with them for a while, but eventually you can let go. And eventually you can even let go and see things that you're like, you don't think are exactly perfect, but you're willing to let them go and, and be put out on the MLS, even if they're not exactly 100% perfect. 
that's a that's a big that, I think that's a bigger hurdle to get through. And that takes some mindset work to be like, oh, wait, you know what? It doesn't have to be super, super, super spot on perfect every single time we go to market and still have a successful sale and a happy client at the end of the day. So that is that just takes time and and giving yourself a little bit of grace to just let that go and see what happens, kind of experiment. So show empathy to your team when you're tweaking them and be like, listen, I, I, if you saw my first pictures and maybe you even share them, like this is the work I was doing um, and to just let them know you you remember what it's like to be where they are. Support growth opportunities is the last one. So let your team teach each other and you new concepts, ideas, strategies they're learning. Invest in online programs for them. We've invested over the years in various programs to help our team feel more confident with color and styling and all of that. We routinely go to our local design center for presentations. We go to our Sherwin-Williams color programs. Anything that you can bring to your team to help them with ongoing education, it could even be part of your team meetings where you have your teams say one of your problems that you want your team to solve for is um, maybe you're feeling stale about the way that certain areas of a home are getting styled, like your coffee tables or kitchen counters or something. Have your team go out and find inspiration images for work that they think is good and have like go through those in a team meeting and talk about what you like about them, what you think you could tweak and maybe what inventory you could use from your inventory to replicate a look that you think is really cool. Like what are the ways they can be thinking more creatively? So always support growth opportunities and build it into your business. We have our triple T, our tiny training topics that go out um, each week in our business. We have our Fab Friday times where education is a part of that, in addition to all of those other things I just listed. So you want to bake in growth as part of your empowerment strategy when you're training and developing your team. So I know that was a very big sip for the week, but I hope it's really helpful for you, whether you have team currently or whether you're thinking about team to grow them better, grow yourself better. Just have compassion for yourself and for your team as you grow, and it will make it all so much better for you. All right, everybody, have a wicked good week, and I will see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you so much for listening to the Staging Sips podcast. If you love what you've learned here today, please take a minute to rate and review it so more staging business owners can find us. And if you want to learn more about how to market and grow your staging business more strategically, I'd love to see you join us inside of the Rethink You Accelerate Mentorship Program. It is open enrollment. And you can get more details at rethinkhomeinteriors.com forward slash rethink you. Would love to see you inside.